Wow, so I was backstage and about this time yesterday, Colin Powell's up here. <laughs> and it started making me a little bit nervous. And so I want you all to do what I'm doing right now. Picture him as a two or three year old. And now I want you to imagine another two or three year old who you've met, remember them, who you thought when you met them that they were the smartest, most creative child in the world. We all have done this. We've all met them. They're all around us. For some of us, when we think of them, they're not even our own children. So here's the question. If we know that there are all these brilliant two and three year olds, where do they all go? Who is stealing our most gifted children? Actually, the real question is, who is stealing the gifts of all of our children? Think about the story that Colin Powell told about being a C student and how he could have easily been overlooked. Now, often, we forget children. We put them in this trap, but it's not our fault. Because we are all taught to think the world looks like this a bell curve distribution. Some will pass, some will fail. Some will get it, some won't. Some have it, some don't. In fact, we built much of our education system around it. And what should seem perverse to many of us, some institutions even validate their prestige by the percentage of students that they fail. What if I told you the world doesn't need to work that way, and in fact, it shouldn't work that way, and in fact, in cases, it absolutely doesn't? That it actually ought to look much more like this. Well, over three decades ago, Howard Bloom demonstrated that with one-to-one -one tutoring, you can get a two standard deviations improvement over classroom instruction. That means you take the 50th percentile student to the 98th percentile. That kind of improvement, that kind of performance, there is no country in the world that sees that. Not the ones you hear about like Finland and South Korea and Singapore. But he's already demonstrated it can be done. And it makes sense when you think about it. So the reality is when you're working one-to-one -on -one with a student, a great tutor knows to think about what the student understands, what they don't understand, really importantly, what they misunderstand, what their interests are, how confident are they, how resilient are they, and then you tailor your approach to that student to that student, meeting them right where they are and taking them to places they didn't even imagine they could go. The great teachers, the very best teachers, they know the same thing, they can do the same thing. There's just one challenge. In a classroom of 15 to 45, that's in the United States, outside the United States, 60. How do you start to get through that to reach each student? So here's the question for us as a society. If a guy three decades ago figured out that our kids could actually move two standard deviations with one-to-one -one tutoring, why do we accept the system that gets the results it gets just because we haven't solved the, the problem of how to do that affordably? Well, some people have not stood on that. They're working on it as we speak. I'll tell you about one, but there are many more. Carl Wyman, some may know as the Nobel Prize winning physicist. He became obsessed with the notion that more kids should be able to do well in science. He started at home focusing on an introductory physics class and said he wanted to look across all of his professors, see how they were doing with their students, and then redesign the course based on the best in science and in some use of technology. The first thing he did was he studied their performance as it's in the status quo. And what he discovered was it wasn't very good. Importantly, actually, some of the worst professors, most of their students, were not mastering more than one or two of the core concepts. So he redesigned the course, and then he got all the same professors to go through it and got results that looked like that. Same basic students, 
same level of motivation, totally different outcome. And I can tell you many more stories. Carnegie Mellon redesigns their statistics course, doubles completion rates, cuts in half the amount of time the students spend in class. Imagine what the students could do with all that extra time. Some of them might even go out for a run. <laughs> the Navy was faced with a different problem. And they didn't have to do it on a shoestring. They went to DARPA. We all know DARPA, hopefully. The folks who actually came up with the internet, and GPS, the stealth fire, the drone, the Mach 20 glider. If there is an institutional embodiment of the Be Fearless commitment, it is DARPA. Here's the challenge that the Navy put for them. We have IT systems, computer systems, as complex as any organization in the world. The uh, only difference is some of them are out on the water. To keep them up, we need IT specialists. We don't have enough, and when we get them, it's really hard to keep them. The market can really pay them a lot. We have new recruits who come in who look like new recruits look. Some have finished high school, some who haven't. A couple may have a few college credits. None hardly have IT, real IT experience. And we can usually put them in a training course for about 16 weeks, but when they come out, they can't actually fix most of the problems that we face. We need to figure out how to solve this problem. And to make a long story short, the folks at DARPA have said, well, it's fairly straightforward. You just need to be able to take your new recruits and then get them in 16 weeks to be as good as your five to seven year experts. <laughs> They've done it. The blue are the new trainees. Now this is a knowledge test. It's the kind of thing you take, lots and lots of questions. I thought this was really impressive, but you know, I kind of go, ah, it's a test. You know, I know when you're experienced, you kind of forget that stuff after a while when you get into the real problem solving. Real trouble tickets. Again, the new trainees are in blue. These are real problems coming off the ships requiring real technical knowledge and grit to solve the problems. Um, on the new trainees are in blue. Again, the experienced folks are in red. That green one, those are the new trainees who went through the status quo training. The reason the numbers are negative is because it means that they actually caused more problems than they fixed. <laughs> and as importantly, when you look to your far left, you can see that the very hardest problems, the new recruits were still able to solve them in large number. So when we talk about 21st century skills, this is what we're talking about. Now the question is, if we can do this in one area, why aren't we doing it in many others? As we say, you have the technology, we can do this better. We have more understanding and better understandings than we've ever had before. Neuroscience and cognitive science are teaching us more about how people learn than ever in history. We now know more about how to identify and describe what it is that experts really know and are able to do so that we can actually ensure that we're teaching people not just to be proficient, but to be true masters. We even understand what the drivers of persistence and resilience are so that people can push through the hard parts and get to the other side of a victory of obtaining real knowledge. We have more capabilities than ever before. As hard as it may believe, the most revolutionary thing about Khan Academy may not be the worldwide access that is provided to people who did not have access to education. It may be that they've created the largest experimental platform in the world for education. Think about it, a teacher who teaches for 30 years in an elementary school, we'll see about 750 students. Khan Academy is now getting three and a half million visits a month. Imagine what you could do looking at not only the outcomes of the learning, but the process of learning that students go through when they are that in that kind of environment. And we can build new structures that take advantage of this. Whether they be virtual sites, testbed sites like Khan and other online environments, or school systems that are highly instrumented in classrooms that are highly instrumented to see not only what the students are doing, but what the teachers are doing and how it impacts learning and outcomes. All connected to big data. Used for good, imagine that. So that we can actually figure out what's going on that we understand and also look for patterns that we don't understand. Imagine all of that being connected to networks and centers on college campuses or top universities where they had centers that were cross-functional between educators and researchers and entrepreneurs and designers coming up with solutions to education's most persistent challenges. This is all, these are all things that are within our reach. There is nothing that I've talked about today that is technologically out 
of our capabilities as a country. This concept has been done in many other sectors before. So why aren't we doing this? Well, there's been a lot of talk lately about the importance of education. Probably, frankly, every president has ever said that they are the education president. More recently, the conversations have said that it's really important to our national security. The Department of Defense spends $70 billion a year on R&D. The Department of Education spends less than one. In any sector, people spend more on research and development, but if you look at knowledge-intensive sectors, like technology and medicine, they spend close to 10 to 12%. We spend 0.2%. So we say that education and learning is really important to us. But I always find that when you want to do big things and when things are really important to you, there are really two fundamental questions to ask. The first question is, what do you believe? What do you believe is actually possible? Because if you don't believe it's possible, there is no reason to start. But the second is, what are you willing to do? Now, I want to end with two important stories for you to note, parts of the story for you to note, both involving the new training that the Navy did that I talked about. The first thing is that the instructors in that new training course were aided with a digital tutor that the students work with for five hours of the day. So that solution in the later times was actually something that could be scaled many, many times over with the same results. Still early, lots to figure out, but I showed you the results. Imagine if it's only half right. The second thing, part of the story I want to tell you is, in the last rounds of these trials, they added oral boards. And it was very interesting. The people doing the oral boards noticed something. They began to say that they could actually spot the new trainees that went through the training when they walked through the door. They had a swagger now, an intellectual self-confidence that did not exist before. And third, I want to tell you a story. The story was relayed to me by the guy who is the creator of the digital tutor. And he said, you know, in one of the later stages, they were in the lab. So students work online, and then they go to the lab to work on actual trouble tickets. And he was walking around, and he actually noticed that one of the trainees was crying. And he thought he'd blown it, um, because you want them to struggle through, but you don't want them to get so frustrated that they shut down. So he walked over to her, and he said, why are you crying? And she said, I don't understand. And he said, what don't you understand? And she said, I'm sitting here looking at this trouble ticket, and I can see that it took them three weeks to work through this problem on the ship. And I just solved this problem in about 30 minutes. And I don't understand how I did it. I have, I have never been smart. And it's at that point, I just wish I could have been there to look at her and say, you are smart, and you always were. We have this opportunity before us. There are little Colin Powell's running around all over the place. 